so um uh, after uh, I left Ireland, uh, I got a very fortunate break uh, early on in my career to uh, work on beluga whales in the Arctic. Uh, I had done my PhD uh, at D Dublin, University College Dublin, on badgers, and uh, it was at the time of the whole badgers, bovine TB uh, issue was raging, and uh, I was able to combine a sort of behavioral ecology with genetics, I thought this was a very powerful kind of um, cocktail of, of, of techniques, and, and it, so it has proven. Um, and in my fortunate uh, way, getting to work on belugas, I got to work on so much more, and uh, hopefully you get a sense of um, the kind of life I've been able to li live over the last several decades and the research I've been able to do at the edge of the world. So. As a little background that I think is appropriate probably for the tone of, of, of this meeting and indeed this week, uh, I'll talk a little about the issues that the Arctic in particular, the North Pacific, a lot of marine environments are facing, obviously climate change, environmental degradation. Uh, just come back from a, a, a capture uh, project on bottlenose dolphins, so I'm a lot redder than usual because I've been outside for the last four days. Um, where we have issues with with the uh, harmful algal blooms or HABs, you know, in Florida, uh, disease pandemics. Um, uh, other issues we tackle are species and ecosystem resilience. So you'll hear me talk a bit about resilience. Uh, and then one really unique aspect of my work is working with indigenous cultures um, across the Arctic, and that's probably among the most rewarding uh, aspects of of my life and my career. Um, we work uh, on a number of endangered species and the recovery of those species. Obviously, um, you know, there's topical issues in the news right now, like the vaquita in the Gulf of Mexico, where we think there's only 10 left. And so there's this problem with endangered species that very often the, the broader public only hears uh, about species when they're at death's door. Uh, and, and so there's a big need there to get ahead of, of some of these problems and, uh, and get these conversations going much earlier. Obviously, sustainable use is, is a big aspect of what I do, and also education and outreach. The genetic work we do has, has applications for trade in endangered species. And at the end of the day, we're very focused on changing actual policy uh, and helping decision makers make decisions. Uh, and I think that's a big part of it is like um, laying out what, what needs to be done and then um, helping them make, make decisions. So, um, some of the species I get to work on, like I said this week, I was working on bottlenose dolphins uh, in Florida and Sarasota Bay. Um, uh, I work on a number of endangered species like the stellar sea lion. I don't know if you can see my cursor uh, up there. Um, other species like harbor seals, several are keystone species to various ecosystems. Some are characterized as sentinels of ecosystem help. You know, if a particular species isn't doing well, well then probably the ecosystem isn't. Um, we have an ancient DNA lab, uh, so we actually also work on some extinct species. You were probably like, what's this mammoth doing on this picture? Um, and uh, we recognize the power uh, in the public's eye of uh, charismatic megafauna. And so how do you leverage that um, to uh, gain more attention and protection for maybe the less uh, charismatic species? Um, and now more and more we're getting into eDNA I'm, I'm learning a lot about microorganisms that I never knew anything about. Um, and so that's uh, something that um, I'm particularly interested in. Um, there's a squiggle on my screen there. Is that, I don't know what that is. Something's popped up. Is that on your screen too? No, uh, I don't know what that's from. So some of the places uh, that I, I've worked in um, you can see here, uh, very remote. Uh, for me, very often, the remoter, the better. So you have the Aleutian Islands or the Arctic. And this could be this could be a bog in Ireland, but it's actually in the Arctic. Um, so uh, some of the people, like I said, um, people, various stakeholders, uh, a lot of native groups across the Arctic, scientists, managers. Um, what are we trying to do? We're trying to do discovery uh, and exploration. Uh, we're doing a lot of collaborative research. 
it tends to be what we call multidisciplinary, where everybody brings their skills and their ideas and, and techniques to the table. And we can combine high tech um, with uh, low impact field studies, so small field camps, uh, and then working a lot with uh, people incorporating indigenous knowledge. So here's sort of a picture of me with a bunch of satellite tags in a, in a tent uh, up in the Canadian Arctic. Here's our ancient DNA lab with a bunch of Oompa Loompas working away uh, drilling teeth. Uh, and then, like I said, you know, we have these long-term kind of commitments to some of these projects, long-term partnerships. We're very invested in the places and the communities where we work. Um, we're trying to expand uh, the capacity to do the kind of work we do to other places, underserved areas, underserved uh, countries as well. Uh, and then ultimately we're trying to make change at uh, uh, the government level uh, in terms of policy. And I would lie to you if I didn't say a big motivation was just the adventure of it all. Um, so I'm gonna give you two examples of sort of two species and the kind of way we do our work. So one is the stellar sea lion and the largest otorhyde um, eared uh, pinniped in the world. Males can grow over one metric ton um, really spectacular animals living in unbelievably spectacular environments. Um, but there's been a decline in a really remote part of their environment, uh, the, the Western Aleutian Islands. And so there's a real interest and a worry and concern about what is going on so far away from, from human habitation and yet not beyond the reach, uh, sadly, uh, probably of human uh, impact. So... Um, the Aleutians are a remarkable archipelago of volcanic islands. Uh, the earliest voyagers uh, were the Onangan people, still there, uh, sometimes known as the Aleuts. And then uh, the Bering Expedition, and uh, notably in the uh, 1700s, Cook's third expedition, uh, chartered part of the uh, archipelago, and, and more recently, um, a lot of research expeditions, including our own. And, and here's a stellar sea lion. They're highly sexually dimorphic. You have these big um, territorial bulls uh, and, and smaller females, but they're not that small. They're actually quite large too. Um, so a little about the background. Uh, the Yunangan people are just truly a spectacular example of a sophisticated hunter-gatherer culture. Uh, everything uh, they used... Uh, they perfected the technology is staggering, uh, including these highly lightweight uh, seagoing kayaks known as badarkas, um, waterproof clothing, and the name Anorak, by the way, is, a, is a, an Inuit name. Um, kayak obviously is an Inuit name, <laughs> um, but um, these were made out of the intestines of bearded seals and walrus, and the spears had obsidian spearheads. They used aconite or wolfsbane, to immobilize large whales. And they went out and these kayaks didn't go over the water, they went through the water. So if there were waves, these people were completely waterproof. Uh, and they also used this amazing thing called a throwing stick or atlatl, which I've actually used myself. And the absolute power of these spears, you can believe that you know early, or early ancestors used these to take down mammoth. They're frighteningly dangerous. Um, but, uh, more recently, obviously, uh, Bering discovered the Aleutians, I'm sure, much to the bemusement of the locals. Um, and sadly, uh, on his return journey, uh, Bering died on an island, coincidentally called Bering Island. No, actually, it was named after him. Um, and uh, this is an amazing voyage of discovery, not just for the, the man himself, but for a, a passenger, the naturalist uh, Georg Steller, who sadly died also quite young. And in this incredible voyage, he documented uh, a huge number of really unique species um, from the Americas. These are just some of the species, Stellar's J, Stellar Sea, uh, sea Eagle, um, the Stellar's Eider, and of course, here's our Stellar Sea Lion. And of course, probably infamously, the, the, the now extinct uh, Stellar Sea Cow, a giant dugong and the size of a whale, which we're actually studying using ancient DNA, and that's, a, that's another story, another talk uh, for another day. Um, so these sea lions have uh, been uh, 
increasing in some areas and declining. And just to give you an exa example of the kind of power of genetics, uh, this entire area to the west of this line was, was considered one large metapopulation. Um, and then when we did the genetics, we found this break uh, between these uh, little dots here. These are rookeries. These are breeding sites of, of sea lions. Uh, and these ones further out, which I've labeled in green, uh, at a place called Somalga Pass. And, and that's one of the beauties of, of uh, uh, doing genetics. You don't know what you're going to find. Uh, and so this was a surprise to us. But like all good surprises, it actually helped explain a lot of other things that people were scratching their head over. So the fact that there was differences in population trend in either of these locations, the fact that there was differences in diet, the fact that there's differences in oceanography. So that's just an example of how genetics can help sort of uh, clarify some mysteries, some other mysteries. Um, and this is where we went on an expedition a number of years ago to understand why in the Western Aleutians things are going so poorly for the sea lion. Uh, and there's a lot of challenges in getting there. Um, these, these archipelago is uninhabited, it's treeless, uh, it's got very extreme weather, and you have a very short field season. Um, there's some large animals with some very large teeth that you're trying to work with. Um, but but uh, the payoff is just, um, as you can imagine, spectacular. It is one of the most stunning uh, parts of the world. Um, islands of the four, four volcanoes here um, is just unbelievable. Um, incredible wildlife, just, just teeming with birds and whales and you name it. And so this is just a photograph from one of my notebooks to show you some of our voyage uh, among these islands on the Orvi Tikla, um, which is the Alaska Maritime Refuge's uh, research boat. This is like day one, day two, you can see. And this is the, the, the split between east and west. So we went so far west, we went east again. Um, so we crossed the international date line. And so that was pretty cool. Um, and then we had to do some pretty scary stuff. And uh, when your friend says, see that spire, you know, you need to climb that. <laughs> and what we were doing was we were putting these uh, cameras um, and that we would leave for the year facing rookeries. Um, to record uh, sea lion behavior. And so um, a lot of it was, uh, you know, climb, maintain, replace, download. Um, so that, that was uh, quite enjoyable. And we did a lot of this work with our Russian colleagues. Um, the second project they're working on is using drones to count sea lions and to recognize marked animals. Uh, they traditionally use planes, which are super expensive. And now, of course, if we can get a ship, we can launch a drone and collect all this data. And by the way, there's a really cool thing online, a citizen science project, where they're asking the public around the world, this girl here, Katie Sweeney, um, to help them process thousands and thousands of photos looking for sea lions that have a mark on them, have a, have a brand. So if anybody online wants to check that out, you, you should become a sea lion biologist uh, overnight. Um, but uh, what we really focused on was catching these little pups, um, which really, once they're born, they kind of have a few weeks before they go in the water. Um, and so we were trying to mark these animals and sample these, get some genetic samples for what I do. People are looking at contaminants, hormones, it's massive international uh, cooperation. And they really are adorable, um, but they do bite. And uh, I think the first pup I caught bit me and I got what's known as seal finger, which is a way to lose your finger pretty quick if you don't have antibiotics. Um, so uh, here we are. Uh, I think this is this is me here. We're measuring a little a seal pub. You catch it in this little hoop net. Reminds me of days in the Phoenix Park uh, catching uh, deer. Um, and then you just cart them over, hang them on a tripod, measure them, all the same stuff. And I'm just going to show you sort of uh, uh, an example of how spectacular uh, watching a rookery in action is. So all these uh, stellar sea lions are, are polygynous, highly polygynous. Um, but unlike, for example, red deer that try to herd and monopolize females, uh, sea lions set up territories. And um, they defend these territories from other bulls and females basically move between these territories. It can be precarious, um, but 
they're basically uh, choosing which uh, male uh, based on his prowess. Um, and so uh, I'm just going to show you sort of how dynamic um, the number of holes and the one uh, further to the shore. Black Rock or somewhere. Um, with Sorry, um, Greg, you might have to just repeat some of what you said. We couldn't hear over the top of the video. Okay, well, I, I wasn't saying much more than what you could see. Um, you could just see how the little pups in in that clip had to quickly get out of the way uh, when these males are fighting. So it's quite a dangerous place to be a little pup, and they all huddle in little groups, uh, which do make it easier for the biologist. Um, but anyway, I. I can send you more videos, uh, but that was just to give you a flavor. And this next one, I'm not going to talk over, but uh, one day while we we're studying sea lions and there's males fighting on the beach, we're collecting pups, we're putting our cameras, these bad boys roll into town and all hell breaks loose. Uh, and uh, it was incredible to see these killer whales move in. And these are the mammal eating killer whales, the transient killer whales. And so you, you might see, um, I think I might have them in a video. Um, oh yeah, so this is a little video of us on the ship just to show you what the illusions are like. Okay, there's a lot going on there. Um, you probably saw at the back of uh, the ship, at the stern, there was a gentleman holding uh, a crossbow. He had a little satellite tag with two prongs that um, they were trying to tag those, uh, uh, those uh, killer whales with. Um, and then you kind of saw the killer whale come under our boat. And of course, then you realize you're just in a rubber boat. So <laughs> it's probably not a good thing. Uh, and this is an amazing shot of uh, a very active volcano that it just that whole island had blown off and uh, completely blown up uh, earlier that year. And we were prevented from getting close to it. But that's usually a sea lion rookery. Uh, and so you can get an idea of how, how dramatic uh, that environment is. OK, so I, I'm going to move on quickly here because I know there might be time for questions, but um, if you want to ask me more about sea lions, I'd be happy to talk about that. There's a lot of people to thank. And then if anybody's interested, there's an amazing um, YouTube. Uh, it's a small movie that won a lot of awards with one of our colleagues, Vladimir Borkanov from Kurils with Love. It's on YouTube. And that will just tell you all you need to know about the kind of work we do and the kind of work this man does. He's an incredible individual. And right now, of course, he's really struggling to get back to um, uh, Russia. Um, with what's going on, and uh, he's really concerned about his young biologists um, and, and their their livelihood and, and what they're doing. Um, so he's an incredible individual, so you might want to see that. Okay, I'm going to switch gears here now to, to talk a little about uh, beluga whales. Um, and I'm going to start big and get small. Um, we're trying to apply the concept of resilience to, to a lot of the work we're doing in the Arctic. 
And one sort of common definition of resilience is the long-term capacity of a system to deal with change and continue to develop. And, and really another, another definition would be um, how systems can recover um, from um, destructive forces. Uh, we're obviously interested in applying that, that to individual species and even ultimately individual animals. I mean, we're the perfect example uh, of how our resilient system can work, how we deal with disease, how we deal with shock, how we deal with a change in our world. So we're trying to use that to try and see how um, a lot of these species are going to have to adapt very rapidly and uh, to a changing Arctic. And the first, the first indication of that is probably a behavioral shift. You know, animals are being forced to make behavioral changes. And so that's the front lines of uh, adaptive resilience. And that's where a lot of our research is going now. There's a lot of concerns over impacts um, on Arctic systems and on indigenous communities. They're highly intertwined. And so a lot of these resilience concepts apply to man and, and beast alike. Um, many of the impacts you're all very well aware of from loss of sea ice, changing temperature, coastal erosion. And then there's the sort of cascading effects of increased shipping, oil and gas development, and what have you, all happening at the same time. Uh, and marine mammals are kind of at central to a lot of this uh, story. They play a critical role in entire ecosystems. They're central to many of the cultures and livelihoods of the Arctic. Uh, and so there's this increasing concern that marine mammals uh, won't be, uh, they're, that they're highly vulnerable, but they won't be able to kind of adapt quickly enough. Uh, and a real concern is over Arctic whales like beluga whales, narwhals, bowhead whales. So one of the questions <clears throat> we're going to pose here is this very basic question of, you know, what is the capacity of beluga whales to acquire new information, new knowledge, alter their behavior, uh, and do it quickly? Uh, and could that be the key to their survival in the changing Arctic? So the acquisition of new uh, knowledge and behavior uh, and how that is transferred into increased fitness. Um, backing up a little, this feeds into my long-term interest in a couple of questions with beluga whales. Do they have culture? Um, when it comes to social organization, are they all kin-based? Is it always good to stay with family, like in many other species, like killer whales and sperm whales? Most of the individuals that are seen together and hang out together are very close relatives. And then there's some other questions we're only starting to ask, some really big questions like, do all social species form societies? How big are those societies? How do those societies function? So um, I'm just going to give you a little clip on uh, beluga whales. And uh, this is a beautiful uh, little video clip from the White Sea. There's no audio, so I can talk over it. And you can see a lot of attributes of beluga whales in this, you know, their uh, white color, um, how social they are, how tactile, their flexible neck, all the incredible um, sort of intricate interactions you can imagine that are going on just in this short video definitely gives you the sense of a, a highly sophisticated uh, uh, species with probably a highly complex social system. But as I said, the one thing you're missing from that video um, is, um, oops, hold on, um, the amazing sounds. And so here's another lovely clip and I will let you listen to this one. Okay, well, I mean, I think that little clip speaks for itself. I mean, they really are mesmerizing animals. Uh, and also you can see there's an awful lot going on there. Um, uh, they can form these massive herds and moms and calves. You saw that little calf was very new. It had these little folds on its side, which means it probably, those are fetal folds. So it was really a brand new baby just popped out. Um, and just this incredible cacophony of sound, uh, music, I guess I would say. Uh, so you can see that this is a, a very vocal, very social, very gregarious species. And so 
you have a diversity of grouping patterns. So again, it kind of points to this complex social uh, life of a whale. So in this search for trying to understand uh, behaviorally, is there a behavioral aspect to, to resilience? We're focused on one main key issue is social learning. Um, that has a lot of implications for cultural development, learning from your own to develop certain traditions. And it also has a lot of aspects uh, tied to the, the social lives and social structure and family structure of, of societies. So we wanted to get at this heart of um, rather than trial and error learning, which can be very um, uh, ineffective and very slow to, to take root in a population, uh, social species have the potential to learn new things from others uh, very quickly. So literally things can go viral um, through a community and uh, through social contact, um, new ideas. This is one of the great attributes of human societies. Um, could it be one of the attributes of, of, of social whales um, where uh, a new idea, a new concept, a new experience spreads, spreads like a contagion? Uh, through, a, through a population. And we hope that is the case because that might be the key to their adaptation and survival. So, um, so do whales have culture? Well, okay, let me explain what I mean by culture. Um, I don't mean this and I do not mean this. <laughs> uh, what I do mean is something more like this. Um, uh, cultural inheritance uh, has been often defined as the storage and transmission of information by communication, imitation, teaching, and learning. Uh, and I pick here the Bedou of uh, um, the Far East or the Near East uh, and North Africa. Uh, and and uh, you'll see why I, I chose uh, this particular uh, human uh, society uh, for my example. Um, the great evolutionary biologist, uh, John Maynard Smith, uh, stated very boldly that cultural inheritance is the most recent major evolutionary transition in the history of life. So cultural traditions have a huge effect on um, uh, the transmission, uh, who, who, who uh, interacts with whom, who marries to whom, who, who mates with whom, and so therefore the interaction of behavior with uh, genetic uh, diversity and genetic evolution um, culture is at the center of that. Uh, and I'm going to use this more uh, sort of the biologist definition, as it were, uh, a much uh, maybe slightly narrower uh, definition. Culture is how information or behavior shared within a community, which is acquired from conspecifics through some sort of social learning. So that's the kind of um, history of uh, the definition of culture. And I should say applying culture uh, to non primate and even uh, not to species other than humans is actually quite controversial. So as well as this was just an example I gave to a meeting, you know, you could have an example of culture where people migrate every year to a particular scientific meeting um, where they exchange ideas and they go the same route year after year or people who support their local soccer team. And there's a cultural tradition to that. And that's acquired from learning about it from from your friends and family. Um, in, in, in nature, um, we, we're pretty confident, you know, migratory culture in species like elephants has, has been well established. And so I wanted to see if that was the case in beluga whales. Um, we know they're highly gregarious. They have this very complex, probably, you know, social system. And they may have the ability to form long-term associations. They have very sophisticated acoustics. And maybe they form communities, maybe they form complex societies. Uh, maybe this all involves social learning. Those are the things we just didn't know. Uh, and maybe culture is at the heart of all of this. And um, I focused on migration patterns. Um, these really are uh, spectacular um, species when it comes to migration. They undertake these massive seasonal migrations. They use very traditional sites year after year century after century, and they seem to use the same migration routes. So we wanted to know something about the genetic structure of these, these different migratory herds or migratory uh, groupings. And so we use genetics for that. We use telemetry to map it with satellite tags. 
And we felt that, you know, if these were very discrete migratory groupings of individuals, um, maybe they were demographically independent, which means what happens in one uh, of these migratory uh, groupings in terms of uh, births, deaths, and marriages is not really impacted by immigration into from another one. So they're, they're, they're kind of quite distinct in terms of their dynamics. And then we really wanted to ask the question, was migration itself a socially learned tradition and might we have evidence of, of migratory culture? And um, this involved a huge uh, amount of collaborations. Here we are uh, on a tagging trip in Canada, putting satellite tags. And there's a lot of uh, Inuvialuit uh, hunters involved in this and they led the whole uh, project. Um, here's some of the tracks of some of these whales. And there's a recent paper just came out on, on this particular study. And it's just, it's just incredible what these animals do. And then um, we found that they followed the same migration routes year after year. And then I'm just going to show you this. Take my word for it, this is a, a, a summary of my genetic work. Not only did they follow the same migration routes year after year, but decade after decade, generation after generation. And so we basically were able to establish that, you know, um, there probably is migratory culture. It's going on between uh, via social learning and it's probably inherited. Uh, it's an inherited form of behavior. And there was a paper we published on that. And then we wanted to look a little more at social structure. And I'll just kind of end on this a little. Um, you know, I asked earlier, is it always best to stay with family? Very often, that's where most biologists start when they think about social species, that they're all related. There's an advantage to, to staying with your family and helping kin uh, versus non-kin. And uh, the theory of kin selection obviously is based on that. It's, it's the theory that tries to explain things like altruistic behaviors. Um, and so we wanted to look at that. Um, so here we are on the left side of my little equation, looking at social structure and kinship. And our assumption was they were kin based. They were all matrilineal, like all these other species that we all know from National Geographic and, and uh, David Attenborough that formed these lovely matrilineal societies like sperm whales and elephants. And uh, we went out in the wild and we collected samples and we biopsied them and we satellite tagged animals right across the Arctic. Um, and uh, what we found was really cool. We found that we have these sort of genetic networks, they're like social networks, but this is kind of a genetic tree. And what we found was that in these social groups, um, sure, we found some individuals that were related, some that were very closely, some that were very distant. But in many of these, these societies or social groups, there was a lot of unrelated, uh, sort of like friends, if, if you will, um, as well as family. And so that kind of shattered that, that myth. Uh, and that has sent us down another road of why would you form long-term relationships with non-family? And I think we all know the answer to that. <laughs> Sometimes you want to get away from family um, and uh, your new family are, are your, uh, uh, your long-term acquaintances where your, your relationships are built on mutual um, support. And so I think this could be what's happening. And just to finally talk a little about, do they form societies? We've looked at one area where um, in Bristol Bay, where usually we get 10, 20, 30 samples, but we've actually collected over like 800 samples, which from a whale in one population is a huge number. And we're finding these fantastic genetic trees of relatedness. And if everybody just stayed with their family, what you would see in this tree is all the all the uh, individuals in one area would be one color, like these would be the mullins, you know, these would be the keelys, these would be the crows. But as you can see, that is not what's happening in terms of social structure. Everybody is hanging out with some relatives, but usually unrelated uh, individuals. So we have a few more things to figure out as to what's going on there. Um, um, so yeah, that's just a summary. And now just finally going forward with a lot of this, we're trying some new tools this year. We're going into the field. We're working with this gentleman, Han Shi Zhuang, to use artificial intelligence and machine learning to look at beluga behavior in the wild in a very passive way. We're using drones. We're using underwater cameras. We're using passive acoustics observations. So we have an expedition 
planned. We just got funded from the National Geographic and the World Wildlife Fund to go to the Arctic this summer and set up a tiny field camp uh, and sort of study uh, belugas in, in the wild. Part of the camp will be indigenous people from the Canadian high Arctic and some of them will be uh, scientists, uh, including a, a colleague of ours from UCD, Paul Galvin. He's coming on this project. Uh, and there's our website, by the way, if anybody wants to check out a little more about what we do, um, wildlifeevolutionandbehavior.com. Um, and uh, so we'll stay tuned. Um, and for me, you know, at the end of the day, it's just about spending time with whales. You can take all the technology uh, uh, away if you have to, I don't mind. Uh, it's just about spending time with wildlife uh, and taking the road less traveled. Um, so uh, a lot of people to thank uh, and uh, thank you very much as well for uh, taking the time to tune in uh, and listen to, to my story. Thanks very much.